Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you so much for attending this uh, special lecture. Uh, uh, today is our great pleasure to receiving Professor uh, Michel Goodwin, uh, Chancellor's Professor uh, of uh, UCI Law School, and uh, also Director of uh, Center for Biotechnology and Global Health Policy. Uh, today's theme is, as we know, uh, patenting human genes and ownership in the human body. I think uh, this is one of the critical issues uh, in the contemporary jurisprudence. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to say uh, today's lecture has double meaning. Uh, the first uh, half, uh, pan help uh, uh, distinguish the lecture designed by uh, our center, uh, healthcare legal and policy center on the one hand, and uh, uh, 68 distinguished lecture designed by our law school on the other hand. Uh, now, let's meet together Professor uh, Michel Goodwin with a great applause. to the screen. Thank you very much for hosting me. It is my pleasure and honor to be here at this very renowned university and law school. And I'd like to thank Dr. Kim, Dr. Park, and all of you who've come to join me for this lecture today. The topic of this talk is about patents and owning the human body. My research has covered these issues for some time, and these concerns happen to be very controversial, not only in the United States, but around the world. And we'll talk about that today. So when is the human body a subject of trade and how is it regulated? There are a number of examples when the human body puts law into action. Organ donation and transplantation is one very key area. It's one of those areas where we're looking to the human body to make advancements in someone else's life but it also involves law. Human tissue donation and transplantation, heart valves, for example, corneas in the eye, tendons in our knee, these are tissues that are popularly traded in the United States. We have thousands and thousands of what we call allograft surgeries that take place in the United States every year. In fact, over 100,000 of these surgeries take place every year. Human bones in the body, also a very common source now of human trade in the United States. Uh, human blood. How big any of you know about the blood industry here? In the United States, is, the blood industry is very, very significant. Um, and around the world, it happens to be quite significant. Sometimes. These are goods that are legally traded, but in some parts of the world, such as in India, there have been what we call black markets to develop illegal trades in blood. Human reproductive materials, very popular assisted reproductive technology, embryos, human ova, human gametes, very popular points of trade around the world now. In fact, many people from the United States now travel to India as a place of having human embryos implanted into others for the production of babies. And then there's hair, and there's even human milk. Now, to give you some example of what this ends up meaning, Colgate, a very popular company that makes toothpaste, Colgate has been involved in bone augmentation and nerve repositioning, right? So the company that makes toothpaste has been very involved in the market 
of human bone and human tissue. L'Oreal, how many of you know this company? L'Oreal, the name familiar, L'Oreal, right? Do you think of makeup, right? L'Oreal buys human skin. They farm human skin, and they have for a very long time. For example, many companies now like to say we do not test on animals. You've heard of this, right? The companies say we don't test on animals. And that's true. Why? Because they test on humans. They test on human skin, they buy human skin, and now L'Oreal has been creating its own human skin. So the regulation of this is not always consistent and it's not always present. We've had many controversial instances in the United States where laws were broken or in fact laws may not be broken because there is no law. One very good example happens to be in the realm of organ transplantation. Right? Lots of demand for human organs, including here in Korea. Lots of demand for human organs, right? Kidneys in particular, a lot of demand, but also for hearts, lungs, liver. But kidneys, a very big example. In the United States, we've had several laws. We start off with the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act from 1968. It's right there, this one right here. That's our first law about human organs. And the purpose of the law was simply to determine who should be able to donate. Simple enough. For example, if my husband dies, that law established that I would be the first person to be able to determine if his kidneys were to be donated. Now you can imagine how important this would be because can you imagine if the wife shows up, the parents show up, and the children show up, and they all have different ideas about what should happen with the kidneys. The wife says, donate the kidneys. The parents say, no. And then the kids say, throw away the kidneys, right? It's a problem, it's a problem. So this law established a rank and order. Who can decide? That was the purpose of this law. The second law here, the National Organ Transplant Act, did something different. It was a law that was created by our Congress after a doctor decided that he would sell organs for people coming from the Caribbean, right? So he said, well, look, and this was a doctor, I should say, who lost his license to practice. He was not a good doctor. And he advertised to people in the Caribbean. And he said, if you come to the United States, and if you're willing to sell your kidney, I'll take some money, and someone gets a new kidney. Well, that was when our Congress stepped in to act, and they said, no. They said no selling of any organs at any time, no compensation in any way, in any form, for anything. And this law pretty much governs what we do now in the United States. But there's been a lot of controversy about this law because even though the law says no selling whatsoever, now many people in the US since then have gone to Pakistan, have gone to India, have gone to Brazil, have gone to South Africa and other parts of the world to buy organs on what we call a black market. In addition, we have over 125,000 people waiting on our transplant list for a kidney in the United States. We know that the majority of them will never receive a kidney. In the US, we do maybe 20,000 kidney transplants a year. Uh, many people die, they'll never get a kidney. Those who understand the risks end up going abroad. But I would suggest that we actually have even more than 125,000 people waiting for kidneys because we have over 500,000 people on our di do doing dialysis in the United States. Right. So, so if you were to add that 500,000 people who were on dialysis, 
with the people who are on that list, then we're looking at hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who need a kidney. And so our big question is exactly how will we get there? But here's another area in which law creates some significant challenges. Patents. For example, just a few years ago in the United States, human genes could be patented. And this was very controversial because in the United States, our patenting regime says that you can't patent anything that is a living thing, a living natural thing. And there have been cases that have challenged that and so that that has been changed. But a case that came up before the U.S. Supreme Court involving a case, a, a company called Myriad, Myriad had a patent on a gene, and that particular gene told us, or gave some indication of when a person might have breast cancer. Many people were concerned about this company, Myriad, being able to have a patent on this particular gene. And here are some of the reasons why. They thought that if there is a patent on this particular gene, it means that the test to find out if someone has breast cancer would be very high. It also meant that it might undermine research because the company could have a monopoly. And in that monopoly, it might not encourage broad research amongst multiple companies. It might block the development and availability of other tests. And there were other concerns as well. In 2013, the US Supreme Court said that DNA cannot be patented, right? That DNA no longer patent. And many saw this as a victory, but the case was actually not as clear cut uh, as even this particular organization thought. There's still a lot of ambiguity with regard to what can be patented and what may not be patented. So what's the role of ethics in all of this? I mean, we really have to ask ourselves, is the human body our own? Does our body belong to our government? Does our body belong to our family members? I mean, and in some families, they'd say, that body is mine. You can, I mean, how many of you, especially when you were growing up, you knew you couldn't do certain things because your parents would say, no, you can't do that. Your body is, is mine, right? And as you get older, you say, well, I can do different things. I can get that tattoo, or I can get those extra ear piercings and, or whatnot. But when you're young, your parents say no, right? So it seems as if your parents own your body. But as you get older, is, is the body yours, right? Um, you know, does it belong to you? Does it belong to your government? Does it belong to business? Now this becomes very relevant because when we think about something like organ transplantation, for example, there are some people that say, well, when you die, your organ is simply wasted when it goes into the ground. Why not let it go to somebody else? Let the government take your kidney, take your heart, take your lungs and give it to someone else. But then there are others that say, well, the government doesn't own your body. They say it's you, it's yours, and that you should be able to make that decision, right? So how do you think about that? Is your body yours, that you make the decisions with regard to your body? Or is it your government? And how should we decide? And these are issues that are unsettled. For example, in the United States with our organ transplant system, we say that it's altruistic and that individuals have autonomy, right? So you get to decide what happens. But in some countries, such as Spain and others, they have a, a process called presumed consent. And under presumed consent, it means that when you die, at that time, the government can claim your organs to share them with other people. And it does save lives. But there are lots of things to think about, such as autonomy, informed consent when you're living. But some people say, when you're dead, informed consent doesn't matter, because you're dead, right? Does informed consent matter before you die, though? Before you die, 
should you be able to say, here is what I want to have happen with my body after I die? Very important questions. And the reason why we ask these questions, we try to root back to moments where we learned. And one big learning moment for the world happened to be around Nuremberg. Nuremberg was the time after World War II where there was a, judici a judicial body that was brought into Germany to look at the aftermath of the Holocaust. And during that time, they examined all of the atrocities that had taken place there, including the human experimentation. And this judicial body came up with something called the Nuremberg Code. And that code was to examine what is appropriate in terms of medical research? What is appropriate in terms of doctors and their role with patients? And what they came up with was that informed consent was very important. They said that autonomy was very important. They also said that there should never be any harm, that doctors should put their patients' interests ahead of theirs. These together basically form bioethics principles. All right, now why does this matter? This slide may be difficult to see, but this is a slide that comes from Holmesburg Prison in the United States. A very famous medical doctor at the University of Pennsylvania was conducting medical research. He wanted to figure out how could the best drugs possible be made for skin, such as uh, pimples on people's skins, you know? Young people, teenagers get pimples. And there are other things that he wanted to find out too. Well, he went into prisons and he experimented on prisoners. So this gentleman right here, he has six patches, one, two, three, four, five, six, on his body. Each of those patches contains a different type of disease. This man, when he was finally released from prison, had various cancers in his body. Now he says those cancers were caused by the experiment done by this doctor. But the point of bioethics is to think about, are there limits? So even if someone says, I own my body and I will allow you to do something to my body, should the law allow it? So should the law protect people who are prisoners, for example? Should the law protect children? So let's say if a child said, I want to be in an experiment, and, it, and I don't care what my parents say, should the law allow that? Should the law allow, let's say, a 10-year-old? Should a 10-year-old be able to say, I want to have experiments on my body because I own my body? Should a parent be able to say no? What about a government? Should a government say, we have found this 10-year-old who has a very unique body, or let's say a very unique blood type, should that government be able to go to the parents and say, we need your child because your child is special and we need your child to be in an experiment? It's an important question. And it's an important question because people are protesting now. They're protesting in the United States. This says, I am not spare parts, right? My body just can't be used in any kind of way. But the truth of it is, there's lots of buying there's lots of trading on the global market. Men in India who've sold their kidneys. Do you see these slashes right there? Those slashes represent where their kidneys were taken out and where their kidneys were sold to foreigners. Should we protect against that? Many of these men are illiterate and they come from rural areas uh, where they don't have very much money at all. And some people say, well, allow it to go on because at least they are making a little bit of money. A Chinese woman advertising to sell her organs. This is in a subway in China. What about blood sellers? This is a guy in the United States who is selling his blood. Now in the United States, it's legal to sell blood. You can't sell a kidney, but you can sell blood. You can sell ova, 
right? Ova is what women produce each month, but you cannot sell a kidney. Now here's something that's very interesting. These two guys, this guy and this guy, they worked at the University of California, Los Angeles. So not on my campus at Irvine, but they worked at the UCLA campus. And this gentleman, he was the director of cadaver procurement, right? So that is the recruitment of bodies for experimentation. He and this guy were selling the bodies. So they would get together, this guy would go in and he would chop up the bodies that were donated for research and he would smuggle them out of the university in black garbage bags. This went on for years and then the case was exposed. Many people donated their relatives because they really wanted research to be done. They wanted to find cures for cancer. They wanted to find cures for the types of conditions under which their relatives died. But these guys wanted to make money. And so they collaborated, they chopped up bodies, and they sold them. But you'd be surprised who they sold them to. They sold them to companies like Johnson & Johnson. How many of you have heard of this company, Johnson & Johnson, right? They make shampoo and other products? Yes. It surprised lots of people that that was one of their clients. And there were other similar clients. So why is this important? It's important because at the ground level, at the very base level, it seems horrible, terrible. They say, throw these guys in jail, right? Get rid of these guys. But then you find upstream, they've got clients who make products that many people purchase. So what do you do in between? In fact, police didn't exactly know what to do with this case because they know about what to do if someone steals a computer or if someone steals a purse. What do you do when someone's stealing body parts? Right? Here's another example. This is a human, human legs, and these were human legs that were replaced by piping. And why? Oh, terrible, terrible. I'll go from, but human eyes also taken and on the black market. Here, a whistleblower speaks to Congress about all of this. Now, let me go back to the slide and see if it's here come to it later. In the United States, we have companies that are called biobanks, right? And these are companies that buy and sell in human body parts, and they're legal, right? They buy and sell uh, tissues, human tissues. But how they get those tissues is a big mystery. Now, sometimes they get them because individuals donate them after death. And they say the whole body is donated, kidneys donated, and the human tissues. But there is also a lot of theft, a lot of underground, what we call black markets, taking place in this domain. And it raises some pretty big questions about safety, right? And we're going to talk about that. So how do we ensure safety when we have people stealing body parts and selling them to big companies? like Johnson & Johnson, right? How do we ensure safety? Um, and how do we do that when the demand for the human body is so significant? I mean, if L'Oreal has its own skin farm, right? If Johnson & Johnson has purchased tissue from the likes of Ernest Nelson, that person I showed you in the slide, how exactly do we create law that's meaningful? How do we have a social and intellectual conversation about these things that treat the human body in a moral way, right? So what should we do when the law is broken? Should we look to the criminal law? Should we look to the civil law? Should we look to sanctions? Now, criminal law would mean when Ernest Nelson and Henry Reed were selling and stealing body parts, should the police have come and arrested them and prosecutors put them in jail? Is that the answer? Well, some would say yes, right? That that is the answer 
find the people who steal these things and put them in jail? Or is the answer that we should sue? Now in the United States, we have lots of litigation. We do lots of suing in the United States. Um, and so when people have, when there is a mistake that happens, or a person is injured, we say, we say, you can sue, right? So you'll get a payment. You'll get a payment. Now in this context, should we allow people to be able to sue when their relative's body part was taken? Because remember, if it's a matter of our body and we're dead, we can't sue, right? We can only do that if it's been our relative. But should the law allow for that? Some people say that the law should never allow for that at all. And what about sanctions? A sanction might be that a doctor can no longer practice medicine if he or she is caught doing this, that that would be the appropriate type of sanction, right? Or that a company should never be licensed to do business again, and that that would be the appropriate sanction. So let's think about this. Here is a doctor, and it's a great example. His name is Michael Master uh, Marino. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Mr. Mast Marino is a dentist. He was a very famous dentist. He had a practice in New York City on a very sophisticated street. And he was successful for a while until he became a drug addict. And the person who noticed that he became a drug addict was his nurse. While his patients were ready to be treated, he was actually injecting himself with drugs. And so his nurse reported him. And after she reported him, he lost his license to practice, but he gained a new occupation. And his new occupation, anybody know what it was? You know what it was. Can you guess? He became a body part broker. He set up three biobanks, and he began trading in body parts. And he did, the, the biobanks were legal and official, but how he got the body parts to be in the biobank was illegal. So he would go to funeral homes and he would pay the directors 1,000 US dollars for every body that he was given access to. So for every corpse he was given access to, he'd pay $1,000. And then what he would do, this is what he would do. He would take the human bone out, he would replace it with piping, and then the relatives never knew. He was able to hide that in the body by pumping the body back up with this piping. And he did that in New York, he did that in Florida, and he did that in Pennsylvania. And he did it for years and he made millions of dollars before he was found out. And it was a difficult case because again, if you steal a car, if you steal a purse or you steal a computer, you know what to do with that. What do you do when someone is stealing a body or stealing bone? Do you treat it in the same type of a way or do you create a new way? Well, in this case, he was prosecuted and he pled guilty. But there were some real concerns. There were fears about disease as possibly uh, there were fears about diseases in the body parts that he took out. Because you need to know what he did with the body parts, right? So it wasn't just that he took them out, right? He didn't play with these body parts. He sold them. And he sold them around the world. And who did he sell them to? He didn't sell them so that they would be in a museum or part of a circus. He sold them to medical providers. He sold them to hospitals. And he falsified the records so that he took body parts out. And some of these people had died from cancer. Some had died from HIV and AIDS. Some had died from other diseases. And he falsified the records. In each of the records, he said that the person was healthy. Sometimes the bodies were of very old people who had been very sick, such as someone in her 70s or 80s who had died of cancer, let's say. And he would change the record and say she was 25 and that she died in a car accident. This raised some very serious questions about the health 
of the materials that went into the market. Which raises another question. Imagine that you are the doctor who purchased this part, right? The part has come into your medical practice, right? You've got a patient, you're about to conduct a surgery. If that patient becomes sick because the part was tainted or polluted or diseased, are you responsible? Now in the US, this, create, this exposes a real tension or problem in our law. Because in the US, we say that the doctors are the learned intermediary. Now let me tell you what that means, because that sounds complicated, even in English. But it basically means that your doctor is responsible. It means that it's not a pharmaceutical company that becomes responsible. It's not someone else. The last person who basically touched your body is responsible. Now there are many doctors concerned about this because you could see in this case, how would a doctor know? How would a doctor know that what he or she just implanted into a person's body was first of all stolen and second of all diseased? They'd have no idea. Right. Here's another case. <clears throat> this is a company, uh, RTI, and it was involved, RTI Biologics, they suspended their import of human tissue from the Ukraine. Now, why did RTI do this? Uh, because there were tainted human body parts. The uh, FDA, our Food and Drug Administration, found that they were transporting tainted parts it's a Florida firm, and they supply human tissue to the US and, and all over the world. Uh, and they came under scrutiny because of some pretty nasty practices that they were doing. Again, I, I must warn you, a terrible picture, probably hard to understand what's in this picture. But in the Ukraine, there was a security guard who came across a van, and in the van, he noticed Human body parts, loads of human body parts. And at first, he thought, there's a serial murderer. There's a, a murderer on the loose that's killing people. And so he called the police. And then as he was looking through, he noticed there was lots of US dollars, tens of thousands of US dollars. And so then he thought, well, what kind of serial killer has all of this money? And then he found forms. And in those forms, he found some answers. And basically what they found was that this US company, RTI, right, this company, this company right there, was buying these body parts. And so it raises some very important questions. How we can have companies that on the front end look like they're doing very legal things, but on the back end, they're getting body parts from some pretty scandalous places. Now, as this says, these are photographs that were taken inside a morgue in the Ukraine by a funeral home owner after he grew suspicious of the morgue's activities. And this was a morgue that was also doing some underground selling. So, let me conclude by saying the following. There is much for us to learn and much for us to consider when we're thinking about the human body and the law, when we're thinking about the patenting and the regulation of the human body. This question about who owns the body has yet to be fully answered. In the United States, most people would answer that they own their own body that they demand their own autonomy about their body. They would even say, perhaps, that our Constitution says that. Although our Constitution does not explicitly say that, our Constitution says that we have the right to liberty and to freedom. And our Supreme Court has interpreted that in many instances to say we control our own body. But controlling our body and owning our bodies may be two very different things. And I would also say something, too, which is to say one other piece of controversy in this is that the U.S. experienced a period of slavery. And after that period of slavery, the United States said, no one can ever own another person. But does that mean you can't own yourself, right? 
So these are some of the questions that are really important for us to think about. And one final thought. As technology advances, it advances at a pace far greater than law. And companies will always want to utilize the opportunity to advance as rapidly as possible. How can the law catch up? And when is it appropriate for the law to be involved? Or when does it make sense to leave companies to innovate and be on their own? And finally, finally, I'd say, we have to think about the role of ethics and morality in all of this. How do we preserve respect for the other? How do we preserve dignity in a space where there's so much to be gained from the human body? And we have to think about at what cost. And with that, I'll conclude and take questions. Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. There was no consequence at that time. In fact, the uh, researcher went on to win many awards, uh, and he made a lot of money. He so um, in the U.S. Uh, in 1980, uh, there was a law passed, the Bayh-Dole Act, and the Bayh-Dole Act allows researchers to patent their research. And so the, the products of their research, basically. And so the doctor who engaged in those research, that research at Holmesburg Prison, went on to patent his findings and to then sell his findings. And he made a lot of money. And nothing ever happened to him. And that raises the question about whether or not the criminal law should be involved. Um, there is so much incentive now to exploit the human body as quickly and as rapidly as one can, especially when there's very limited uh, criminal law intervention. And one th last thing I'll say is that it used to be in the nature of our universities, and it may be the case here, that it was really important to publish. The idea was that you do great research and you'd publish your research and the university would take enormous pride in that. But now we have patents as being a very important feature of what happens at a university. So in the US, we used to say publish or perish. And now for many researchers, it's patent or perish. And if it's about patenting, then it is about trying to get as much data as possible, and sometimes in ways that are very nefarious or very crooked, if you will. Thank you, it's a good question. Did you say you brought a lawsuit against the doctor for the seven damages? He, well, this is a this is very good uh, question, yes. So in that particular case, um, I believe that that gentleman did be, attempt before he died, and I don't know that he was successful. Here's an example, a better case example, is a case called Moore v. Regents. It's a very famous property case in the United States. It's a case that involves a man who had a very rare disease. It was called hairy cell leukemia. So he had a very rare leukemia. And he sought, he sought attention from doctors. And for years, he went back and forth to the doctor. And the doctor removed his spleen, took his blood, took his plasma, took much from his body. And eventually, Mr. Moore found out that the doctor had created a patent on his cell line and had created a collaborated and created a company and it was suggested that the patent at one point was worth about three billion US dollars. A lot of money. So Mr. Moore sued civil litigation. So he sued the doctor figuring this should be easy. The doctor lied. He didn't disclose and he exploited knowledge from this man's body without his permission. He went to his doctor for treatment. He did not go to his doctor to be experimented upon. When Mr. Moore sued, he lost. Because 
the California Supreme Court said a person, one, did not own his or her own body, and two, said that it was very important that researchers are able to do this type of research because if people could sue, the research would end. A lot of my students have a big problem with that case, and you probably do too. Other questions? Yes, sir. Would you say that that's a precedent then? So maybe that researchers may use that to their advantage and maybe use it in a way that is not moral? Yes, that's an excellent question. You must be a very good student. All right, so, so yes, it did set a precedent. Um, that particular case did set an enormous precedent, and um, and that case has lasted for some while, but we, we also have a bit of a split, and here's the split. That case, Morvey Regents, was a state law case, right? And so in the U.S., we have state cases, and we also have federal cases. And so that precedent held at the state level, but years later, there was a case that involved uh, a coroner who was taking corneas uh, without consent. So people were dying and their bodies were sent to the coroner's office for the coroner to determine the uh, mode of death, such as is this a homicide, is it an accident? What the relatives did not know is that the coroner was taking out the corneas and selling them to a company called the Dehaney Eye and Tissue Bank. The coroner would sell them to the tissue bank for about three or four hundred dollars a pair. The Dehaney Eye and Tissue Bank would resell them for about three or four thousand dollars, making a lot of money. So when this came to light years later, there were some relatives who sued. And there was another precedent that was established. And that precedent was that relatives have a quasi-property interest in their relative's body. Right? So the federal court, this Ninth Circuit, said you have a sort of kind of property right in your relative. Which raises the question, do your relatives own your body after death? And here's what's interesting in terms of inconsistency. Remember that slide I said inconsistency? Was that Morvey Regents was in California and it's still good law as state law. It hasn't been overturned. The Ninth Circuit, anybody know where the Ninth Circuit sits? It's a federal, it's a federal court, but it sits in a jurisdiction. Any idea where that jurisdiction is? California. So there you've got two very different approaches to law, one at the state level and one at the federal. In the United States, eventually, when there's that kind of conflict, it goes up to the Supreme Court because the Supreme Court likes to make clear when there are conflicts between state and federal or conflict between the federal, the federal circuits, then it goes up to the Supreme Court. I don't know that this will go up, these kinds of issues, to our Supreme Court anytime soon. That's a great question, though. I have a question. Yes. When you said human part, you introduced a Supreme Court decision that human parts are not patentable. But I wonder, well, if we reduce the size in a very, very extreme way, if we can reach to a very, very small cell that does not have a typical nature of human beings, like the genes. And then I believe that the Supreme Court has considered the, the human nature being uh, in when they make it just that decision. But what if we have a very certain small things that lacks a typical human nature? Mm -hmm. So our so there's a case, the Shakabardi case, is a case from 1980, and it was a very important, what we call a landmark decision, because our Supreme Court, in a very split court, it wasn't a unanimous opinion, said that something that actually happens to be natural could be patented. It was a bacteria, uh, a living bacteria, 
So the court said that this living thing, before then, a living thing had not been patentable. In this particular case, this living bacteria, the court said, well, it could be patented. And that opened the door for the research and for the patenting of things that are, uh, that are in nature, right, or things that are living, that opened the door. And so that opened the door then to genes and whether or not genes and gene sequences could be patented. It opened the door for the case more v regions and that research. That case coincided with the Bayh-Dole Act. So in 1980, we've got the Bayh-Dole Act Congress saying that we really have to innovate and they really wanted researchers to be at the forefront of innovation. And at the same time, we had the Supreme Court case. So it sent a very strong signal about researchers, get out there, innovate, and then you can patent what you innovate. And now we find in 2013, the Supreme Court rolling that back because, because human life was at stake. I mean, in, in 2013, the case involved a breast cancer gene. And there were people who were deeply concerned about the morality of patenting something where it could involve life and death, right? So a woman who is poor can't afford the test that, has, that is the result of this patent to find out if she has breast cancer. And I think that that was deeply disconcerting to a lot of people. Yes. criteria for the price that they serve? Oh, this is another great question. Okay, you all are very, very brilliant people here at uh, this, this university and the law school. And to repeat the question so that it's captured on tape, is that if there are biobanks and companies that are operating uh, in full light, if they're operating legally, uh, then do they have certain price points? basically, for what it is that they sell. This is a great question, and here is why. In many ways, the human body is worth more per inch than the most expensive real estate in the United States. Because a human body can be worth about a quarter of a million dollars. A human body is worth about $250,000 to one of these companies because a kidney can be worth about $50,000 to $75,000. Uh, tendons in the knee are worth a lot of money. Heart valves uh, can be worth tens of thousands of dollars. Each of these parts has its own market value. And it has its own market value in a transparent space and it has its value in what we would call the black market space. The black market space being that illegal space that we only whisper about, that we don't talk about openly. One of the biggest challenges, I think, in this domain is that these companies seem very legitimate, and some of them are. But where they get their parts from, these body parts, um, raises many different questions. And let me just put it in context. As I've said, we have tremendous demand for organs in the United States. We have over 125,000 people waiting for kidneys, and we have 500,000 people on dialysis. So needing kidneys, kidneys, is a really big deal. But we only have 20,000 surgeries involving kidneys per year. How in the world do we have hundreds of thousands of these tissue surgeries where do they get the tissues from, right? I mean, because you would imagine if it's, if it's voluntary, if people are voluntarily donating tissue, wouldn't they donate an organ? So how can we have so much of one, but not so much of the other? Clearly, there's something very gray that's happening in these spaces. Yes, sir. Oh, I would like to ask, like nowadays now people are starting to actually 3D print organs. Yes. So when we think about it, morally standing, 
Who owns those organs? Then? That's a, another good question. I'm going to have to stop saying it's a good question because you all are asking such good questions. So, would it be the company that's printing it? Or would it be the person who's paying the company to print it? Now, there may be conflict between those two entities. For example, it might be the person who's paying for it who says, that's mine, I own it. But the company that's printing it might say, but I own the technology. I own the way in which it happened. And if you want it again, you have to come back to me to do this. And you can't go to somebody else because I own that technology. And that's another really great, great way to sort of think about a problem, right? So if you went to a 3D printing company and you said, I need this because it's based on my particular body type, should all of that be yours? Because you've paid for it too, right? You, you've paid for it. Uh, but you could certainly see that business saying, well, not so, not so quick, right? because we don't want what we've learned how to do to now be taken over by somebody else. Right? I'll give you another example. In the human biological sphere, we have intended parents, we have biological parents, we have adopted parents. Um, in assisted reproductive technology, hear this out, uh, it becomes very complicated. So let's say uh, if we had a map of the United States and there's someone in New York. And that person in New York is infertile, right? Can't have uh, children biologically on his or her own. So what she decides to do is that she is going to purchase someone's ova who lives in California. And she's going to purchase someone's sperm who lives in Texas, right? And she's going to find another person who's in Chicago, and that person is going to be the gestator, right? Now, what does, what does she own? Does she own that ova because she purchased it? In the United States, yeah, she's purchased it, now it's hers. Um, the sperm, she owned that? Yeah, she's purchased it, it's hers. Now we take this all and we go to Michigan, and the embryo is implanted. When the baby is born, is the baby hers? What do you think? Do you think it's hers? Well, it turns out it's an area where we have a gap in law. Wait, wait, I'm gonna wait for your answer. Is it her baby? You say yes? No? It's really hard to answer. It is hard to answer, okay. Well, this is a perfect example where technology outpaces law. Because in the United States, in most states, the person who gives birth is the mother. So this woman in Michigan has no biological relationship to this baby that's been born. But legally, she is the mother. Now if she decides, I changed my mind, I'm keeping the baby, even though the woman in New York purchased the ova and purchased the sperm and rented the womb, not her baby until the woman in Michigan says, okay, I now give you this baby. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, good. Oh, the Kagita, so did you tell me to go to Asmika? Yeah, I think you're more so. 또이 어바인 UC 어바인 노스쿨하고 고려대학교 법전원하고 관계가 더 돈독해지는 그 계기가 될수 있으면 좋겠습니다. 고맙습니다. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the great lecture. I uh, hope uh, this will be a great opportunity to strengthen uh, the relationship between UC 어바인 and Korea University. Yeah, 감사합니다. 네 오늘 어, 이렇게 많이 참석해 주셔가지고 많이 감사합니다. 에, 사실 어, 듣는 사람이 없을까 봐 걱정을 많이 했거든요. 많이 와주시고 또 좋은 질문을 해주셔서 어, 우리 고려대학교 어, 
빛내다고 생각합니다. 고맙습니다. 안녕히 가십시오.